This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our series in the book of Proverbs. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing God's Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity, the privilege, the time, the good health, the freedom, everything you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue under the heading of A Righteous King and Fools. We are in verse 10. Unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. This is one of those proverbs that seems rather simple, but I want to show you the literal translation. It reads, A stone and a stone, an ephah and an ephah. Now, what this indicates is that they are not equally fair. Now, this is something you have to get from knowing what this type of reading means, some sort of background, some sort of study. Here's what I wanted to show you from this particular translation. So it says, a stone and a stone, an ephah and an ephah, and here's the translation we get. Unequal weights and unequal measures. Do not assume because a translation is literal or what they call word for word that it's the best, uh, even a good translation, because it doesn't convey what it means. Sometimes it's confusing or you do not know what it means. And this is a good illustration of that, where we see translators do interpretation. Remember this, all translations of scripture include interpretations if they're any good at all. My point is that sometimes people talk about, well, it's a word for word translation. Somehow they think that's a better translation. Actually, that could be a worse translation because it really doesn't convey what it's meant to uh, teach. <clears throat> so this is just one of many illustrations I could use to use, but I wanted to start out with that today. Well, let's talk about the proverb itself. An ephah was a dry measure, so the merchant may have one weight not equal to the other, and then he would use a sleight of hand to cheat a customer, depending on whether he was buying or selling. Think of those scales that people have sometimes, and they'll put a weight on one side and weigh the item on the other or the maybe the gold dust or something like that if you've ever seen those westerns and and um, then you uh, get an idea what this is talking about so they would have a light weight when they bought something and a heavy weight when they sold something you see and they could cheat the customer that way unless the customer had his own weight uh, how would he check it well this type of weighing an item is detestable the word abhorrent it's an abomination to the Lord the Lord doesn't like cheating um, the Lord is disgusted with cheating at any level even down to the simplest transaction in the market it's dishonest the Lord hates dishonesty and business whether it's shortchanging and you can extend that principle to false advertising. Deceptive practices are all abhorrent. It corrupts the system. It corrupts people or a business, a company, a city, even a nation if you have dishonest tradesmen. Nations should have fair business practices with other nations as well as their businesses and it must be avoided. Now we're talking about this originally given to Israel. Israel were, God, were uh, God's people and they were to have God's honesty, 
uh, his standards and these type of things. So any type of fraud should be eliminated. Any type of fraud. Standard weights and measures should require legal permission or approval and be enforced. In Israel, the righteous Lord stands behind them and practice. In practice, it's the king, the priest. They're the ones who set the standard, like in 2 Samuel 14, 26. That's for kings and then the priest in Exodus 30, 13. You may have been to a gas station and seen someone measuring out gasoline into a container uh, or they were checking it as if they were checking chemicals. Well, that would be someone checking the measurements to see if they're accurate or the, perhaps the octane, see if there's any water in the gas, that type of thing. They test it for quality and octane to make sure it's up to the standard that they claim it to be. Now, we want that. <clears throat> the Lord requires ethical purity throughout the nation at every level. Honesty in business practices is necessary to maintain the integrity of a business. No one likes to be cheated or shortchanged. So it's important if people are going to treat people right, and that comes under the general heading of uh, love one's neighbor, that they be fair. Now, this is important in international trade as well. Now, we see those type of issues come up when we see, uh, for instance, today, United States and China and the imbalance of trade that went on for many years so that we were buying a lot more of their products than they would buy of ours or there'd be a much different price or uh, the favored nation idea where perhaps some nations would get a better deal than other nations. And if we have good leadership, they'll hold other nations accountable. Now that's important. We want our businesses to make a fair profit. Uh, we don't want our government in trade to be cheated either. So today's government policies should enforce honest and fair business practices. A crooked trader would use uh, lightened weights and measures for buying and heavy ones for selling. A number of script scriptures speak of this, including some in the law. Let me give you a short list. Leviticus 19.36 Deuteronomy 25, 14 through 15, the prophet Ezekiel 45, 10, Amos 8, 5, Micah 6, 10. Let's look at Leviticus 19, 36 for a moment. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This Reminder at the end is that the Lord is watching over them. He redeemed them. Now they're to be honest in what they do. We were speaking about translations a moment ago. See the phrase, you shall have? That's not even in the text. But it's a legitimate translation because it carries over, this phrase carries over from the previous verse. So you have a list going here, but you have to know enough about the Hebrew that this is being carried over. So word for word, it's not, at least these first three words. But you can see how you need to know how to translate, uh, which, effect, of course, affects your interpretation. So I just wanted to dispel, to dispel that myth about word for word translations are best or literal translations are the best because they're not always. Um, you want to get the meaning the, the, uh, so you can get the proper interpretation uh, both in our understanding and if you're teaching you want to write an accurate teaching. Well, verse 11 informs us that even when young people even young people can be deceitful. 
This is a tendency for the youth who don't want to get in trouble with their parents or authorities, or their teachers. Verse 11. Even a young man in his evil acts disguises them, so is his conduct pure and upright? See, that's actually a question at the end. I didn't start it out that way quite, but one more time. Even a young man in his evil acts disguises them, so is his conduct pure and upright? The evil acts here, the word, let's just put it all up here. <clears throat> Ma'alal usually means bad or evil acts. It's a maltreatment of others. So a young man in his evil acts disguises them. That's the idea. So here it means the evil deeds of youth. It says he disguises them. The word nakar. In the Hithpael stem we have here, it can mean to make oneself unrecognizable. So what he's doing, he's covering his evil deeds. Now you may have seen the first line is not like many English translations. And the second is in agreement with, well, for instance, the NIV 11. What happened? It appears that some of the translators missed the difference with the Hifpa'el definition. You see, Hebrew has what they call stems. They're active, passive, reflexive, and they can get a little bit intermingled in there, but, but it, gets, uh, it gets a little complicated, and they have different meanings in different contexts. Well, in the hith pile, uh, this word means what we have here. So he disguises it. He disguises it. That's the idea. And that changes the meaning when it's in the Hithpael. So what's the lesson here? The lesson here is that a child is deceitful from his youth. Now we know that. As a kid learns that he can cover things up or maybe he can lie and get away with it sometime, he will do those small lies. Now parents got to be careful here because that parent may be useful doing small lies. Maybe the wife hides something from the husband or vice versa. The child picks up on that, or maybe the parent trains the child, well, don't tell your father, you see? So this is something you gotta be very careful, parents. I know you do it because you think you're doing what's best, but you're teaching the child something that's wrong. Uh, mothers end up teaching it to their daughters. Daughters pass it on to their children. And they may call them white lies or it's innocent. You just want to make sure no one gets hurt. But honesty is always the best policy. The lesson is that a child is deceitful from youth. This stems from the previous proverbs that speak of a king, for instance, instance who must watch out for deceit in his kingdom. Now that's in verse 8. That all hearts are not pure. Verse 9. That adults in business demonstrate deceit. We saw that in verse 10. And now we see that there's a tendency among youths to cover up their evil acts and deceit. So the question is, that comes up in the verse, so is his conduct pure and upright? Is the child telling the truth? This is one reason they... Sometimes I have trouble with children's testimony. They tell people uh, what they've been told to tell them. Or they're covering something up themselves. Now listen, parents. Wise parents should be aware that their children do these things. So the question is his conduct pure and upright? In other words, is the youth really being pure and upright? Or are they covering something up? Now this passage tells us that corruption starts at birth. It continues through youth into adulthood. And in this particular context, it's put in check by a righteous king. So in our day, we would have laws that say, well, you can't get away with that in the business world. 
or you can't get away with that uh, in uh, your particular profession because it will break down the integrity of whatever your business is. If you show yourself to be a dishonest doctor and the community picks up on that, it could ruin your reputation and even your business. A lawyer. Well, people often make fun of lawyers because of the way they make money off of other people's problems. But you want an honest lawyer. Reputation is important in many areas of life. And part of it is just being basically honest. How many times have we felt that we weren't treated right by a mechanic or an auto mechanic or a plumber comes in and charges an unbelievable amount of money for a half hour's work. We have problems with doctors sometimes because they charge so much. Now, of course, with a doctor, you're also paying for his knowledge, which is a huge asset for any doctor because he can analyze a situation, tell you what's wrong with it, maybe within five minutes. But it took him years to learn that knowledge. I remember that. Well, that doesn't excuse overpricing anyway, but that's not just them. It's the insurance company and other things, and that's sort of one of my soapboxes I get on now and then because I think it's just ridiculously expensive. But it's built up to be that way. Well, any kind of deception, lying, and cheating must be disciplined out of a child. The sin nature within a child is very active. Many restraints have to be learned. Parents have to train and discipline them. Um, this is what's best for the child. Keeps them within the bounds of morality. So parents should do their best to teach both by their own example and training of the child. Now what is unfortunate is when a child does not have a responsible parent to train them, to be honest, in word and action. So he grows up and he naturally cheats people gets away with what he can. Uh, this is where uh, government, by that I mean law enforcement and the courts, must hold people accountable in fair business de dealings. Maybe he or she will learn to be honest that way or at least restrain from it for fear of penalty. One of the problems we have growing in our country is fatherless children. Boys who don't have fathers at home. Uh, they learn to get away with things because they're not disciplined. A parent works or they've got problems. They're not home and watching over the child. The child has to raise himself or is raised by his, his neighborhood kids or the gangs. So these children grow up to be cheats, even criminals. And that has moved into many professions as these children grow up. I say professions, not always what we would consider professional, but whatever job they do. And where there are rules, they have learned to break them when they were young and they continue to break them when they get older. As a youth back in the 50s and 60s, when we played sports as kids, now it was amazing because uh, compared to today, we would go to the empty lot and we'd have maybe 10 or 15 kids playing baseball because you need a lot of kids to play baseball if you're going to have any kind of decent game or we'd play football this was even true up into high school we'd have uh, we'd play tackle uh, without equipment of course and that was always fun but dangerous but one of the things we did we didn't have referees and umpires if someone tried to cheat, everyone would get on to him. So you wouldn't even try. Oh, yeah, there was close calls and there was arguments. No one's talking about that. But, but you just didn't regularly cheat. Now, a lot of kids have gotten away in the last 15, 20 years from lack of discipline, lack of parents being home. And at the adult professional level, cheating is common. So you find the use of drugs 
uh, illegal spying, however that takes place on other teams, doped up bats, bats and balls, whatever they can get away with. Not to mention the corrupt business practice surrounding, surrounding things like pro sports. What I'm saying is, it carries on into the adult level. And I believe that's why some sports are basically ruined now. That's part of it. There's too much cheating. A lot of money has, has, has spoiled people. But that's part of the free market trade. I understand that. If you want to pay somebody $10 million to put a ball through a hoop, that's your business. But at the same time, you see people get away with stuff all the time. They want to get an edge. And in doing so, they break the rules. And if they can get away with it, it's allowed. And everybody, oh, ha, 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 ha. You know? It's bad enough that so many professional sports are corrupt in, in other ways. But now, just in recent years, they've politicized sports. The major sports are ruined, in my view. Because it's not about the game. It's not about having fun, being loyal to, to your, being loyal to your team and your community, and vice versa. It's about winning at all cost, making lots of money. Now add to that promoting one's political views. I don't go to a ball game or watch a ball game to see somebody express their political view. I don't care about your political view. So keep it out of the sport. Don't run the sport. Don't expect, expect a viewer to recognize something that he thinks is very wrong. Now, to me, that doesn't even make good business sense. Why, do, why would you run off a bunch of your audience so you can show your political opinion? What does that accomplish? Those who are once sports heroes have political, become political activists, and they're killing their own sport. The tenets of some of these sports now, especially like the NBA and other, other sports as well, has, has went way down. It's a big turnoff. Who wants to watch a bunch of cheaters and then foolish activists, especially the ones that are anti-American? Now, I'm, of course, speaking for those in the United States. And they wonder why people don't want to watch them. I've done it to themselves. Now, I'm speaking to you from the standpoint of this being a business as well. They're costing themselves an audience. That makes no good sense. It doesn't make good business sense. But you see, political activists are often that way. They're not concerned about someone else's making money. They're concerned about getting their cause across. And that's the popular thing now. If you have a platform, then use it. And I just find that I have a lot more important things to do than watch a ball game when it comes to that type of activity. Well, honesty carries over into speech and again, business. And we see that in the next several verses what we'll probably get through today. Speech and business. Chapter 20, verses 12 through 19. Verse 12 functions as a Janus. Remember that it goes two ways. It looks backwards and it looks forward between the preceding section and the following section. Verse 12 tells us that the Lord has given us perceptive faculties so we can be discerning. When I say perceptive faculties, I'm talking about those things that we use to see, hear, perceive things. In particular, the ear and the eye. Verse 12. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. Let's talk about the hearing ear and the seeing eye first. This line looks back to the need to be discerning, um, to be uh, wise, for example, in those weights and measures. Watch what they're doing. 
Listen to what they say. We learn also this applies to the king because the king is the one who rules over the nation. He is to hold the high standards for the people, the businesses, filters down to the businesses. Uh, we learned about parents. Parents need to be perceptive about their children, what they say, watching them, what they do. If we go back to the king, the seeing eye gives the king the ability to discern whether there is evil in his realm. That goes back to verse 8. Correction can be made to one's own sinful tendencies by oneself or for that child by the parents of a youth. You see, God has made us and given us perceptive organs to perceive what is evil or not. We need to use them. The ear is where most of our corrective teaching is received. We need to listen. We listen to truth. I don't know about you, but when it comes to truth or someone teaching truth, I really don't want to miss anything. If I'm watching or listening to a video and audio, I'll, I'll go back and listen to it again because I want to hear that. I hope, I hope you're that way and listening to these videos that you don't want to miss anything so you don't skip stuff because that is the very thing you probably need or the very thing that's missing in your thinking that puts the thought together. I don't want people to have a tendency to, to skip over lessons or skip series. Sometimes I get questions from them. I said, well, they didn't even listen to the basics. They have even heard the elementary stuff, and here they're asking things that they need a, a lot of stuff that they haven't even heard yet, aren't listening to. And you don't want that kind of gap in your learning because that gives gap in your thinking and your application. So you're applying things wrongly, and you have wrong priorities, or you make wrong decisions. Um... It's an amazing thing. This is God's word. And people treat it like it's the local news. This is God's word. Why would you want to miss out on what God has to say in his word? So the ear is where we get our corrective teaching. That's where we receive it. The eye is useful for detecting deceit and being discerning. We want to see it. I want to see it for myself. Yes, you do. That's one reason I one reason I like to use illustrations. It helps teach. Um, so you have both the ear and the eye. But when I don't put something on the board, then that means you have to focus with your ears. You have to listen. Now, see, a lot of us are trained from watching television just to watch and just rely on our eyes. But if you're listening to God's word, you want to hear. Now, if you're reading it, then your focus is, of course, through your eyes. But what if God is speaking to you through somebody's voice? It may be a recording. It may be live. You need to listen. I know sometimes and um, I used to go to different churches and I say, well, this guy really um, is not teaching the word much. But I'd sit back and say, well, maybe God has something to say through him. Let me see if I can pick up on it. And I'd listen anyway. And sometimes I'd be very disappointed because well, he didn't hardly say anything at all. I just wasted half an hour or however long he teaches or doesn't teach, I should say. In the book of Proverbs, the ear almost always represents being teachable. And the hearing or listening almost always represents listening and obeying. This tells us that a wise believer is one who knows what is going on around him. He listens and he watches. I want to read that again because I want you to hear it. 
A wise believer is one who knows what is going on around him. He listens and he watches. A wise person learns fast that after hearing someone say one thing and do another, he does it again and again, that person can't be trusted. Now the point of the proverb that we just saw is to use your ears and eyes. Listen and observe. To learn wisdom and apply it. This is how you develop wisdom and how you discern good from evil. Let me just add one thing here. If you know an older Christian, someone who's doing this for 20 or 30 years, they can give you multiple, multiple good applications from a lot of principles. Not only they've learned them, but they've applied them. And they can give you different results. But you know what? How rare it is that a younger believer will go to them and say something like, well, run me through the different scenarios. What's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? You'd be amazed how much that can get you ahead on something. We do that in a lot of the other areas, don't, you? don't we? Don't we depend on the older doctors for the best wisdom sometimes, the most experienced? Uh, we want the most experienced car mechanic. We want someone who knows what they're doing. It's, too, it's true in wisdom, too. Not, now, just because they're old doesn't mean they're wise. But if they've shown themselves to be faithful believers, and you know that's the case, boy, there's a friend. There's someone you want as a friend. And they can be a great friend, a great asset to your Christian life, and they can help you grow, give you good advice and counsel. Young people need this constantly. The problem with young people is they think that being independent of other people is a smart thing to do. It's grown up to do. No, it's not. No, it's not. I really enjoy listening to someone who speaks truth. And sometimes it doesn't have to be in Bible teaching either. It can be in other areas. In science, for example, they really know their science. Or they know their history. Or goodness, even things like geography. There's a lot of things I don't know about geography. But I'm curious. I want to know about this. Oh, is that right? Is that there? Or maybe it's anthropology. Something more scientific. Verse 13 looks at the lazy person. So what do you want to do? You want to grow as a Christian, utilize what God has given you to act and live wisely, but then you come across a lazy person. Now, how do you know this person's lazy? Listen to this ver proverb. Do not love sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes, have plenty of food. Now this is a rather simple principle. If you love sleep, that's a, an idea or the way of saying that you're lazy. Now, not that we don't need sleep, but if you're always sleeping in, oversleeping, sleeping on the job, taking a long nap in the afternoon. Uh, loving sleep is indicative of someone who really doesn't want to work. That's the idea here. Not that you can't take a nap. I try to take a short nap about every day. Close my eyes primarily. But it also gives me a moment to get recharged, a few moments to get recharged. But it's not always easy to get in that kind of environment. Too much noise or things going on in my mind. But sleeping here, as portrayed in the scripture, is often the, a sign of a person who is on his way to poverty. Now, we're not talking about kids sleeping in on a Saturday morning, or even a parent sometime on the day off. But an adult who always sleeps in, 
avoids his responsibilities, or even a kid who neglects his own chores, doesn't get up in the morning. Boy, if you ever lived on a farm, that just doesn't work. Because you have hungry animals, chores to be taken care of. Uh, if you have a, a field to work in, you got to get out there with the tractor. You got to be out there by sunup. You don't, you don't want to waste daylight. And you may work 12 hours that day, maybe longer, as long as the sun's up. But you're trying to get the crop planted or plowed or in. Now, this was common in the ancient world. And it's also common in the uh, agricultural communities today. People get up very early. When I was in the military, it was, um, it was quite an adjustment for me because they would try to get us in bed by 9.30 or 10 at the latest. But we also had what they called a reveille at 5.30 every morning. Now, when you got out into the... Uh, Forces, you got out into the uh, regular military forces. You're not in training or something like that. You'd be uh, getting some days off now and then. You could sleep in if you could, but that was hard if other people didn't. I worked a night shift a lot, and uh, it was hard sleeping. During the day, sometimes they'd have inspections, and here you were in bed. And sometimes they expect you to get out of bed and not sleep for a long time because they had an inspection. Then they begin to let up on that when they got word that these guys work all night. And they say, well, yeah, they need their rest, so they want to be effective on the job. It's often the case that the most productive people get up early, but not always. Some are late-night workers. Um, I've had a late-night routine off and on for years. But if you have a job you have to get up early for or where you have to be there, you can't always do that. The point here is not when you sleep, but you don't sleep your time away. You don't sleep your life away. It will cost you. It'll cost you production. Think about that, folks. The three hours you sleep in in the morning, you could have spent that in, well, listen to a video. We need our sleep, but not too much. And wise people know this. That's the lesson here. In verse 14, we continue this idea of deceit. A deceitful buyer. Now this is interesting. Watch this. Bad, bad, says the buyer. But when he goes away, then he boasts. Well, what's this all about? So here's the idea. A person buys something. He looks it over says things and paints it as a not a very good price. Oh, this is really overpriced. This doesn't look like it's worth the money. And there's the seller there watching. Now you think in terms of more of a marketplace where you got buyer and seller facing each other, or, um, the owner and the buyer there. And so the buyer kind of complains and hems and haws about, uh, I think it's probably not worth this and uh, can't, make a decision. He's really putting on a show. Uh, he really wants the product, but he's selling, telling the seller that he's probably not going to buy it. So the seller gives in, and the buyer gets the product cheap. Even though he's willing to pay more, he just wanted to finagle the guy down. So it says here, when he goes away, he boasts. What's he boast about? He boasts that he got such a good deal. He deceived the seller. He got a better price. And maybe the seller really needed the money at the time, was willing to give up some profit. So the buyer, he brags about how he got away with cheating the seller. Well, fairness was never on his mind. Now, over here in the United States, haggling is a practice you often see at things like garage sales or flea markets. Or you see somebody has a car up for sale, you'll go up and say, uh, will you take you know, a few hundred less or this or that? And people try and get as much for the product as they can. I understand that. But in some markets, some 
places where people sell things, and if you've been around, you know this, some sellers will intentionally overprice something, expecting to haggle it down with the customer. The uh, thing about garage sales, we have those in our neighborhood. Uh, people are usually trying to get rid of something. And uh, one of the things you learn is that clothes don't sell. Even if you have some new clothes you've hardly worn, you can't hardly get anything but a dollar out of them. Maybe not even that. You almost have to give them away. Because people like the style or the fit or something. You know how shopping for clothes is like. Well, anyway, the principle is that the customers will haggle down the price and the seller still gets what it's actually worth. He overprices it at the beginning. Now, uh, that can be in a regular market. And I'm not talking about a garage sale where that has a whole different atmosphere. Now, it's a typical practice in Oriental bazaars that people will haggle over something. But at the same time, it often involves deceit and dishonesty. They'll overwrite, they'll overwrite the product. They'll overprice it. And you come in and you, uh, if you're the buyer there, you want to do just the opposite. And what if the customer doesn't know how to haggle? If he doesn't know to ha how to haggle, he doesn't know how to bargain downward, they say. He may pay a lot more for the product than he needed to. And the seller gets a lot more than he should have. Now, there's a slight problem here. I call it slight. Sometimes you expect this when you go into this kind of market. But there's a problem with doing business that way because there's lying and deceit. Deceit. It's not the best way to do business. Now, it's not as bad as a thug coming up and taking something from you. No, it's not that kind of robbery. Not that kind of stealing. Because there you have the threat of violence. But even that's dishonest as well as the other. Both are dishonest. Um, it just depends on the situation. But you know if you're being honest with someone. You know if they're paying way too much. You know if it's not a fair price. And you should have a sensitive conscience as a Christian to make sure they're not being cheated. And you feel a lot better when they go away. And you, you may have sold something a little low, but you didn't cheat anybody. And they, they wanted it, and they might have needed it. Now, this is actually this type of overpricing and haggling, that type of thing. That's not a lot different than just common everyday, what we see today in uh, the way people advertise. A good part of advertising is deception, pulling it over people's eyes. <clears throat> I often watch these uh, television stations that show these uh, older TV series, the older ones, it might be an old Western or some old, old comedy that was made back, it's often black and white back in the uh, 60s, maybe the 50s. And the advertisements are tuned towards older people. So you see these medicines that older people would take. And they're just different names for the same type of medicine. And you wonder, do they really work? And I thought, well, you know, it'd be nice to have a little more energy, a little more brain power or something like that. So you'll do some research on it. And uh, it's phony. It's phony. But they keep right on advertising. They'll get big celebrities up there. And say, oh, that guy's got to be honest. I liked him as a cop back in the 1960s. No, he's trying to make money off false advertising. He doesn't know if the product's good, but then he get a doctor up there and he's, oh, yes, I'm Dr. Such and Such, and I've researched this, and I've invented this, and this is the best thing for you in the world, and, and you end up looking at it, into it, and you say, wait a minute, this stuff doesn't work. You know, they have these star ratings on the uh, Internet, and one to five usually, and you end up getting a one or two, and you say, why the one or two? And say, well, it. Uh, they didn't. They didn't give you the right product, or they sent you the wrong thing, or they didn't send it, and they didn't give you a refund, and there's all sorts of problems with it. And then, then they just say, "Well, it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything." Or maybe one out of ten say it does something. And that's probably psychological, but anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Just a quick illustration, and this is 
interesting because this effect this affected the website that my own website uh, a couple of months ago I think it was in April I had to renew my website which involves updating the programs to keep my BibleAcademyOnline.com online. Now I started this years ago um, because I was starting. Uh, they gave me this I don't know what they call a starter's price or something, and it was a it was a it was a, not as much as you thought it might be. But it was a few hundred dollars, and plus you buy all the stuff you need to, to get on it and the uh, side programs. You know the stuff you need for the the uh, video recording and the uh, board I draw on and the programs and all that stuff and it starts to amount to some good size money and and then uh, it comes for renewal well you only do it every three years in this particular website so it's up for renewal again it just came up recently and the guy called up and he said it's going to be this this amount and I was shocked actually they sent it to me in the mail saying it's due and this much is due and I go what and I'm not kidding you. It was like four times more than I originally paid. Four times more. And I called him up. And I said, what is the deal here? I said, well, the first time you did it, or the second time, the last time, I can't remember which it was, you got this discount. And we don't give that discount now. And I go, really? Now, here I am invested into this particular company for this website for years and it would be a major undertaking to move my material and start up another website well we have to almost 1300 videos now it'd take probably a couple of weeks to get all that set up and not to mention the time you wouldn't have of new videos coming out at any rate um, he talked to me like, well, I'll get it down to a little bit less. And he did a little bit less. So I found the money. Um, I paid it. And I said, now this will take care of everything for such a period of time, right? I want to pay anything for a long time. All right, now some of them are annual charges. Some of them are every three years you pay on them. So you have to expect a bill every year for some smaller things and he says no you're all paid up now for for uh till the next year for these smaller things three years for the big things i said okay fine well a few weeks later i got another bill and i go what so i happened to call up on a weekend and i'll try to shorten this story but it's a good one i call up on a weekend and uh you know, they give you choices on the phone, so I end up picking one who I wanted to discuss the billing. Well, they sent me to technical, you know, tech help. It happened to be that that was the only ones that was open on the weekend. So I talked to this lady, and uh, we went round and round on this, saying, ma'am, I shouldn't have to pay anything else. Well, it's there on the bill. You're supposed to pay this. I said, ma'am, I paid for everything. You know, I, 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 I argued with her, honestly. I, honest, honest, honest. I shouldn't have to pay anything. I paid this big chunk of money. shouldn't have to pay again for next year. She says, no, no, no. So I, um, I looked at my, I got into my account. I looked at the account, and uh, there it was right in front of me. And I actually was reading it wrong, one, one wrong the, the wrong one back to her but she got onto the account she got onto the right account then I got onto the right account she says well I can give you a lot I can give you I can give you a better price than that so rather than this very large price she cut it down to less than half in fact it was probably closer to almost a third of what I had paid so she refunded me everything I did on that first time, and we started over. So now the nervous thing was making sure my refund gets back in. The problem was I had to have the money up front for the new deal. Even though it was on about a third, I had to find that money, so I had to get some money transferred, and I found it, and I got it in there, and, and I paid her, and then a few days later, I got another bill. Oh, not again. So I called up and I talked to the guy, and they gave me the billing specialist. I, say, why I said, why am I paying again? I just 
she, and he looked at the bill and everything and said, well, uh, uh, they, they got to him and hauled there. And I come to find out it wasn't a bill. It was part of another refund. So they're refunding, him, refunding me even more than I was supposed to get. <laughs> at least that's why I picked up on it. But he said, no, we don't have anything for you here. And I, he, he finally didn't figure out what was going on, but I did. So I'm not sure how this is going to come out. But let's just put it this way. You never know who you're dealing with when it comes to business, and especially online. And the, the point I'm saying is, if everyone had just to give me the best deal at first, I mean, I'm a loyal customer. I've been with them for years. I think it's six, six years or so now, this one website. If they just give me the best price for a good customer, then it would have been over with real quick. But you see... I know they want to make their money, and they probably get a commission. She says, I said, he's probably getting them a commission, isn't he? So he wants to get as much money as he can out of you. But see, that's the way you've got to, you got to watch out for them. I don't like to do business that way. But you don't sell somebody something, then quadruple the price the next time it comes around. Because uh, I was thinking about now I've got to change websites. So anyway, it worked out okay. I'm not sure what's going to happen yet. They may come back and say, well, now you've got too much refund this time. It wasn't that much more, but it was like $100, I think, more than I may have supposed to have got. But then I looked at the sales slip, and that's what it indicates. I'm sure that's what they're looking at. Somehow they missed the uh, the discount the first guy gave me, which is like 100 bucks. So they may have over-refunded me 100 bucks. But I also know that when you try to get back and straighten this out, it can make things worse. But uh, anyway, I do want things to be right. But I really felt like they were trying to slight me, at least the first guy. So I don't want to talk to him anymore. So just be careful when it comes to business practices like that. Um, these things apparently aren't near as expensive as they claim they are. Well, we come to verse 15. It compares expensive jewelry with knowledge. Now, here's one for us. Verse 15, 2015, there is gold and an abundance of corals, but a precious jewel are lips of knowledge. You're probably thinking, corals? Now, if you know something about jewelry, you probably know what corals are. You probably think of that stuff that's under the ocean, those rocks that have all sorts of colors, and, those, and you're correct. That's exactly what it is. It's the what they call uh, paninum in the Hebrew, and it's corals. It's a red stone found in large reefs in warm areas, and they use it in jewelry. They use those rocks. They may use it for diamonds or part of the jewel itself or as the jewel itself. When it says here there is gold in abundance of corals, it's telling you that there is uh, wealth in precious stones and metals. But a precious jewel are lips of knowledge. Let me get it back up there for you. But a precious jewel are lips of knowledge. Now, this tells us a couple of things. We just learned about honesty. Honesty is the best policy when it comes to business. Here is telling us that even more so is someone who is honest and knows their business, their product. They know their product. I know when I buy something, especially it's in the technical area and it has to do with the website, I want to know about the product. Tell me about it. How's it work? What's it do? What what does it not do? You know, I can always tell you that. So honesty is not just in business, but you also want someone who knows their product. Now, sometimes people tell you things because they're ignorant. They're ignorant of the product. They don't know. And you come back later, why didn't you tell me that? Well, they didn't really know. Why didn't you tell me it didn't have that function? Well, they didn't know. But sometimes they don't tell you because they know it doesn't, even though you may want it. But they're trying to sell it. So that's deceptive, right? The point here is 
You want someone who has knowledge. Someone who knows what they're talking about is very valuable. It's as valuable as jewelry. Now, in our context, we're talking in particular about the Word of God. You want somebody who has wisdom. I remember not long ago, I was <clears throat> reading this uh, thing that the New York Times put out called the 1619 Project. Uh, it's being taught in schools now. It's being promoted by the uh, uh, public school system. 1619 Project is based upon the fact that the uh, United States, we weren't actually a country then, but uh, there were slaves brought in for this or that, and uh, they were for this purpose, and the country was founded on slavery. And you read those articles and say, wow, I mean, this stuff is something else. And then you come to find out not one of those articles are documented. And this is what we call fluff pieces. They have no documentation. In other words, it's propaganda. Now, some lady may have told a story of her grandmother or her grandmother's grandmother, and that may be a true story. But there's a lot of stories out there it's another thing to have documentation, uh, to have uh, good eyewitness accounts of an item or a situation and someone who's researched it thoroughly and knows it to be true. So you look over these articles, you find out, well, none of this is documented. In fact, a lot of it's just hearsay. And what was probably more surprising than anything is some of these people are professors now, professors are supposed to have expertise in their field, but you come to find out they don't document their stuff either. So basically, they're using their uh, teaching post for a podium to teach their views on something, how they think something should be, or something they're against. And it may be they can't document it, and that's why they don't attempt to do it, because then, it, then that'd be proven to be untrue. But see, a lot of people read these things and they don't even think about documentation. They just accept it as true. Just like watching uh, major news media today, they accept it as true. Well, the news said, my son, uh, he's a teacher, he's a professor, and he tells me sometimes about what the students do. And the student comes in and, and he writes a paper for him and tells him all this stuff and not one ounce of documentation. It was opinion piece. And it was on one of the topics today, and, and uh, I said, really, did he show any kind of do documentation? No. He says, and when my, my son talked to him, he says, well, that's what the news says. That's what the news says? See, this is one of the problems we have today. People don't want the truth. They don't want to research the truth. They don't want to challenge these things. But you see, people who read these things don't care if it's true. It's propaganda feeding what they want to hear. Now, in this verse, the comparison is not saying that wealth is bad, but knowledge is more valuable than wealth. Anytime you're under someone who is teaching or public speaking, you want to know that they know what they're talking about. It's much more satisfying to talk to someone or hear someone lecture who really knows their stuff. In this context, in this proverb, we're talking about here when it comes to lips of knowledge is a person who has wisdom, knows the moral code, thinks with those values. He thinks through what he is saying and makes sure it's accurate when conveying it to others. And this is a type of speech that brings honor, peace, riches, and long life, as the Bible says in other places. One of the most important things in life is learning the truth and then clearly communicating it to others. Well, that brings us to verse 16, which I think we'll begin next time. So we'll stop here. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word, for your truth, for the many things we have heard today. We ask this that you'll challenge us with the truths that we've heard that we'll think about the application and make the proper application in the power of your spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.